Well, kia ora everyone. Welcome to our uh, seventh webisode in the series Otato Nahiri. It's the second of our Regenerative Futures brought to you by uh, Pure Advantage. And this particular series is in partnership with Tane's Tree Trust. Uh, the, the webisodes have been presented and managed by uh, Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Who we're very grateful uh, for their assistance. My name is Vincent Herringer. I'm your host for this series and for tonight. Um, and what a series it's been. It's it's uh, opened up a whole world of possibilities for us talking about the potential of our native Nahiri. Um, you'll find a lot more information about the whole uh, theme on our website, uh, pureadvantage.org, including the beautiful film of farmer Ian Brennan, who is in the process of turning his um, his farm in the Waikato into a, a, a beautiful uh, regenerative farm full of um, native trees, uh, fresh water uh, and sheep and beef and a very cute dog called Cassie. In fact, it's called Cassie's Farm, the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, That's exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, in this series, we've um, looked at a lot of problems. We've uh, been scratching our head about all the reasons we shouldn't and can't and won't plant native forests in New Zealand. Um, and so tonight's um, really about changing that uh, paradigm into a conversation about opportunities and possibilities and hope and ambition. And to help us with that discussion, I'm joined by a really esteemed group of panelists, uh, Dame Ann Salmon, who uh, is a, um, I'll get the language right, distinguished professor at Auckland University in Anthropology. Uh, Peter Berg, who is a forester and the chair of uh, Tane's Tree Trust is in the studio. Hello, Peter. Welcome um, in Auckland. Uh, also, Natalie Whitaker, who is the founder and our uh, co-founder and CEO of Toha and a, uh, a Gisborne resident uh, in uh, Tairawhiti, uh, also where uh, Damien, I think Damien is beaming in from all the way from Devonport today. Uh, possibly. Um, and Jeff Ross, a uh, well-known entrepreneur and uh, less well-known sheep farmer and uh, and stomp, stomp, stomps about now in his gumboots. So we're going to hear about what Jeff is up to. So thank you uh, very much for joining us. You'll see the bios of all of those fine people on the chat and also on our website. Well, let's just rip into it. I, I thought, Damien, I'd like to give you the opportunity to to cast for us a vision of what success could be. And I know that you are not lacking in vision or in ambition. If we were successful in this program of getting our native indigenous Nahiri to revive and flourish, what kind of place would it be? I had the privilege of beaming into um, a global webinar um, last week uh, of, of Nobel Prize winners uh, from around the planet. And what they were talking about was basically a train wreck of colliding crises. They were talking about climate change, but they were talking about biodiversity losses. They were talking about what's happening to the ocean. They were talking about radical inequalities. They were talking about what's happening to our soils uh, across the planet. You know, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we're part of a much, much bigger story. And it's really important uh, to realize how incredibly urgent this is because these people, some of the finest thinkers on earth, gave us a decade um, to deal with these, this you know, cosmic train wreck which is going on at the moment. And uh, the, the, they included, for example, James Lovelock, um, the great thinker who came up with the idea of Gaia. And he said, actually, climate change is a biological problem. What we are doing is releasing millennia of photosynthesis in a geological instant. This is the burning of fossil fuels since the Industrial Revolution. And, and deforestation. So it comes, bears directly on our, the issues we're talking about in this webinar. And they all talked about siloed thinking, the dangers of fragmented science, of um, short-term vision, of extractive, exploitive kind of ways of relating, not just to um, other life forms and living systems, but to each other as well, and how, how urgently we need to change this. And then they came up and they were, but at the same time, they were all sort of expressing a kind of guarded optimism, which I share. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about the web of life and that what we, what we absolutely have to do as people on this planet at the moment, and in Aotearoa, New Zealand, you know, I think we have an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, one of the, maybe in some ways, you know, one of the 
best opportunities, a small intimate society in these very beautiful diverse islands of ours. And we have the chance to actually tackle these things together and intelligently. So it's all about intelligent land use, intelligent ways of communities structuring themselves to make a living with the land, with the rivers, with the sea. And it's much more than the right tree in the right place. That's part of it. But it's this idea, the vision that I have of our country is, is one where we have this mosaic of land use, where we are using you know, the productive land for productive purposes. We're taking land which is best suited to being closed in native bush uh, for long-term carbon sequestration, but as habitat for the birds, for cleansing the waterways, um, and also uh, providing timber potentially, beautiful native timbers uh, for, for our own uses. And this kind of tapestry of land use is woven across the land so that the birds sing again and our rivers run clean and clear. And we have thriving communities, communities that have got, because radical inequality is all part of this as well. It's mm. that's the extractive use of people. And um, communities that are no longer disengaged from the landscapes that support and, and surround and animate us, but are radically linked with them and working with them in ways that are uh, thoughtful, uh, productive, creative, humble, not arrogant, um, and where we're learning from the people on the land and people that have been on this land for a long time too, which is the Tangata Whenua. Mm. You sometimes hear people say if New Zealand can't do it, nobody could do it. Did, did that kind of expectation come up in that meeting of minds? I think, um, you know, what I, what I learned from listening to those great thinkers, you know, the Dalai Lama was there. I mean, it was amazing. It was an amazing group of people talking about the, um, about the future of our planet, not just the future of our country, and that sense of urgency, which I think this is a problem we have. We have everything going for us, but there's a lot of people that have no idea how urgent this is. Mm. And many of our leaders, I think, are kind of fiddling while Rome is burning. Uh, thank you. That was a, an excellent corridor um, and set us up well for this discussion. Um, Peter, you uh, are a partner in this whole series with Pure Advantage. What what was your motivation? You know, what is why did you set out to do this work uh, on uh, Otato Nahiri? First of all, I must say that I, I really love Dayman's vision and uh, the way she expressed it. And of course, a lot of that is about why we got started. Um, we realised that if we were going to make a difference in New Zealand and in a forestry sense, people had to have the ability to do it. They needed to be better informed. They needed to have the proper tools and so forth. So uh, when we set up Tane's Tree Trust, we uh, uh, that was our focus. But it's become pretty clear over time that we haven't been talking to people enough. We probably haven't been listening enough. So uh, this series uh, gave us the opportunity, firstly, to hear from a lot of other people who have got great ideas. It's, it's really about giving people a voice and uh, hearing what they're doing and seeing how we can add that to the process. But it's also about um, giving people access to the information and mm. the ideas, not just ours, but uh, uh, those that many other organisations are now contributing. Mm. Uh, you know, one of the things that struck me about all the content that's on there is that there's a lovely mix of um, ambition, uh, kind of business ambition, but also quite technical discussions about how, um, you know, where trees should be planted. I'm thinking of is, is David Norton's piece on... Um, you know, the, the 10 rules for native forests. So there's a there's a real kind of, um, it is Dave Norton, is it? Dave Bergen. David Bergen, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so there's a lovely mix there, isn't there? And that that's kind of your mission, isn't it? Of, um, yes, strong ambition, but practical tools. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, things like the carbon calculator, we've got uh, uh, a series of how-to information uh, gradually coming onto the website. Uh, we link with other information where we need to. And uh, uh, first and foremost, it's about making sure that, uh, as I say, the pe people have the tools and uh, the information they need to mm. do. I, I think it's a great resource. But of course, we need a great attitude. And I'm thinking, um, Jeff, 
uh, you know, you have written the book on overcoming difficulties. Every Bastard Says No is the name of the book about your uh, success um, with 42 Below. What kind of attitude should we be adopting to this problem uh, as a country? Because uh, I could give you a billion reasons why we, we can't solve it. Kia ora, Vincent. Kia ora all. Look, being part of Pure Advantage, um, you, you know, for well, since the onset uh, for 10 years, what we did at Pure Advantage is recognise there was an oncoming climate challenge. And as Dame says, uh, I think we should now, Dame Anne says, we should now call it the climate crisis. So the first thing we need to do is act with urgency. A decade is a, is a very short period of time. Um, Pure Advantage's approach was that... To, that economic um, um, shifts need to happen to drive behaviours that will help heal the planet. And the two can happen side by side. We, we recognise that our country, to succeed in a global marketplace, has to draw on its unique advantages, hence the name Pure Advantage. One of our advantages is obviously the, the way we present to the world. So we don't want to look like whole bunch of other countries and that's why monocultures of pine trees is is not going to help our unique advantage it's not going to help necessary tourism certainly yes. not going to help biodiversity mm. so so first of all we need to move to much larger amounts of of native forests and and that's obviously why we're, we're part of this program um how can we do that fast how can we do that um and adopt the right attitude look it's very easy at a time like this to to point the finger and blame other entities um, and blame the government. I, th I think what we've got to do at a time like this is is lead ourselves and make a start. And moving now just to, to farming, which we're, we're now involved in a, in a station, Lake Aware Station, we've planted over 15,000 trees. I mean, the really interesting thing from, um, from New Zealand's point of view is actually we have another advantage here. So much of our land, for instance, in New Zealand is, is sheep and beef farm, 40% of it. And that's a low intensive agricultural use. And um, the farmers we speak to are pretty keen, actually, to, to plant more native trees, um, not just waterways, not just marginal land, uh, but shelter belts and, you know, some pretty large tracts of land on their, on their land. And that, that can make a huge difference. So... Mm really long way of answering your question to 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 make a change we've got to start individuals even if you've got a small backyard we can all plant a tree right farmers can plant trees uh, and and if you don't feel you're in a position to to do that then support our town history support trees that counts there's this fantastic organizations which peter is is leading that allow all new zealanders to make a start and and lead the world so so tomorrow morning, wake up, either plant a tree <laughs> or work with honey trees, the trees that crown, and, and get them to plant a tree. That's how I like the way that you've linked, you know, that obviously that sort of practical action, but to a, a kind of global, you know, it's a New Zealand, it's a brand issue for New Zealand is, is we've managed to slather our beautiful land in these exotic trees and more and more so. Um, we're actually not helping our ourselves in a, it, it, at the very least at a brand level no no at the very least certainly not at a brand level i mean we don't we don't like monoculture nature nature never invented a monoculture and, and i'm sure Damien will, will support me there i'm not a, i'm not, not a scientist um point one so we don't want to become a country that looks like a monoculture not not an agriculture not not in our forest not in anything um but certainly do we we don't want to be a me too to parts of canada or parts of norway we want to enhance amplify the unique cultural and biodiversity values that we have if we do that it's going to it's going to have a halo effect on to, to you know all all of our export items mm. natalie um thank you um jeff very interesting natalie you, what, one of the uh, I, I suppose ambitions you have with um uh, the work that you do is trying to bring market solutions to gnarly problems. Um, and Jeff has just challenged us to think about not just the government fixing this and the government fixing that, but the market is not working for native forests, is it? Is there something that has to be done first to fix the market before we can bring market solutions? Uh, kia ora, everybody. Um, 
Yes. Uh, yes, it's, they're not working for native forests. Um, but I think the, the first step is to realise that we make the markets. <laughs> we are the market. And so what we want the market to do for us, we can we can, uh, we can stipulate that. And uh, it is really, I think my, my experience as, as the founder of uh, Give A Little really taught me about the power of crowds. And, you know, whenever I've come too close to the politics uh, that so much of these decisions is, is driven by, I've, I'm always reminded by uh, something that uh, a, a politics lecturer um, once said to me, which is, if you really want to make change, you have to move the bricks of public opinion because politicians are just like balloons in the wind. They just flail about on a spectrum and move wherever the bricks of public opinion allow them to go. Mm. So we have, markets are just tools. <laughs> they're, just, they're just a set of mechanisms to help us achieve what we value the real question we need to be asking ourselves is why is the market missing the value of our native forests and just the environment more generally? And that is the work that we've been focused on in Toha is to really get to the bottom of what drives markets, what makes them work, <laughs> what do they need as a prerequisite, and and where we've kind of landed is that this is all driven by measurement and data. Every single market that is in play in the world is really just flowing information. The problem is, is we haven't, we haven't spent enough time building up the information and data and measurement about the true value of our native forests. Mm. And the moment we solve that, we have the opportunity to start to ask the market to do different things right. with that information. So for me, this is about the science, it's about the measurement, and then packaging up that data into instruments that can then support the market to, to value and put a price on, on this incredible asset that we are at risk of losing. Mm. So I, I, I just don't accept that the market is flawed. We are the market. <laughs> we better own up to that. And, and then it start sounds like you're saying that people are flawed. I've never heard of such a thing. Um, Peter, it's very interesting. She is talking about values, and we're, that's something that's come up a lot in our series, isn't it, about the, the full value of trees, the full value of, of forests, not just for timber. Um, for, you're a forester. Um, tell us, you know, from a forestry perspective, what other values do we need to elevate and and then following uh, Natalie's um, suggestion you know measure quantify put some and put put some hard data into it but you know what other values of forests should, do we need to be um, looking for well I, th I think first of all the point that Natalie's made is is absolutely correct and and you're correct too that everybody in every webinar we've had has at some point raised the fact that trees and forests have provide a whole lot of other values and when you plant a tree you're transforming a landscape you're transforming the environment and you're doing it for a long time because those trees are going to sit there for a long time and they're going to do a whole lot of other things they're a perch for birds they're a habitat for birds they're holding the soil together they're cleaning the water uh, i mean this is all stuff that we probably heard about even at primary school. You, you know, if you ask your children, or in my case, grandchildren, about these things, most of them can tell you some of that. But uh, Natalie's also correct in that um, those sort of values are not easy to monetize. People can't uh, translate it in a way that's meaningful uh, to them. And uh, I think that it's um, one of the problems with things like the ETS that uh, it, it doesn't recognise the fact that uh, these other values do exist. And uh, in fact, uh, as uh, we've already acknowledged in other webisodes, ETS probably disadvantages native trees and encourages people to move in another direction. Mm. Well, let's talk about that because the ETS is a is a at one level quite a bold attempt to put some value onto timber, put value onto uh, dare I use the word carbon farming, 
I, if I was in the room, Damien would be throwing something me, at me at this point. But Damien, what, what is wrong with the ETS in its current form that is not allowing uh, our native forests to be uh, planted, to, for, for landowners to be rewarded? Well, the, the ETS is a sort of attempt to build an artificial market because it's, you know, this is a, a market which has been sort of set up, if you like, in order to try and deal to, to generate carbon sequestration uh, so mm. that the country can meet some of its um, climate change goals. But the problem with it is, is, is it's riddled with legacy effects. I mean, our fo experience of forest, forests over the last 50 years or much longer, actually, in New Zealand, when we've gone into silviculture, um, for a very long time now, we've been focused almost entirely on exotics. And so we've got pine trees researched to the nth degree, and we know how much they'll sequester above ground at least, you know, in different parts of the country at different ages, and we can put yeah. a price on it. And this is the problem mm. that um, Natalie's talking about. We can, we can put a price on that because the work's been done. Yeah. Uh, but the native forest, and I think this is a, a kind of an extreme version of colonial cringe. You know, when the European settlers arrived, we looked at the bush, we started to burn and fell it. Um, you know, we, we used a lot of it to build our building stock, um, but also we cleared it and then we put it into pasture and we put a lot of land into pasture that never should have been into pasture. And then when it all started falling apart with boulder, but before that, we, we started we thought, well, what are we going to do to hold it together? And lo and behold, we came up with pine trees again. You know, we're using exotic solutions for problems that we have imported in a way, mm -hmm. instead of looking at what's already here, both in ways the ways of relating to landscapes and seascapes, but also our fantastic biota, 80 million years of independent evolution, of, you know, co-evolution of plants, animals, uh, and 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 uh, the, the waterways, the ocean, our mountains, and so on. And the wisdom of 80 million years of you know, co-evolution, we think we can kind of solve in, in the blink of an eye and come mm. up with something smart, like put it all in pasture or else put it all in pine trees. And we're trying to do that with the ETS. You know, we're using an exotic solution for an imported problem, and we are, are absolutely ignoring the amazing potential of what's already here, which is our native biota. And it's not just good for carbon, it's fantastic for biodiversity, it's brilliant for waterways, it's great for the ocean. It's also wonderful for the way to of our place, for tourism, for thriving communities and so on. Mm. And it's, it's this legacy effect that's baked into the ETS makes it actually a really stupid instrument in many ways. Because what we're doing is making the same kinds of mistakes as we've made in the past, again, with the ETS. Yeah. When we, we've we got other solutions available to us. How, how stupid is it, Natalie, um, in, in your region? You know, what would be the implications if we if the ETS was left on its own? What, what would be the outcome? I'm thinking of Tairawhiri. Oh, yeah, this is very, very serious. Uh, so what we know... Uh, you know, more than anecdotally now, because there is research and report that has uh, research that has been done to regionalize the impacts of a soaring carbon price and in an ETS that doesn't properly uh, uh, or adequately value the carbon sequestration potential of natives. We have a runaway transition in land use underway from uh, productive sheep and beef, um, and also productive pine forestry. I might have active management of pines, uh, and and the we've been told that this is a fight between foresters and farmers. It's absolutely not. the the real The real fight that we have is the fight for against permanent pine forestry because permanent pine forestry is not active management. There's no jobs associated with that. It's it's a set and forget solution. It, it, it allows people to, or it allows uh, the carbon market to basically trade value that uh, shows up as nil uh, for communities. Uh, and there is just real risk. On the East Coast, um, you know, I hate to think, but you know, at, at risk right now is land classes six to eight. Uh, we have an, an overseas investment office loophole that persists allowing 
overseas investment that would normally be uh, prohibited from purchasing farms in New Zealand. We currently still have a loophole that enables overseas investment to, to access land on the proviso that it's flipped to forestry. Mm. Now with current projections on carbon price, uh, we, are, we are giving overseas investors ac access to New Zealand land for permanent pine forestry off the back of the carbon price projections. This is a sovereignty issue for New Zealand. This is an environmental issue for New Zealand, and it is also an economic issue. But this is not something that we are not in control of. We just need to get informed and ensure that we actually are having the conversation that we need to have, but urgently. Hmm. Can I chip in on that one? Yeah, because please do. I, because I totally agree with everything that Natalie said. You know, it's, it's not just happening in Te Rapiti either. It's happening in many other parts of the country. And, um, you know, we are transforming our landscapes in a way which is just completely, uh, it's, it's so counterproductive for our country, for our countryside, for our landscapes, for our soils. I mean, talk about permanent forest. A pine tree will live 80 to 90 years. A tōtara tree will live 800 to 1,000 years. You know, we're talking about permanent solutions. Mm. What on earth are we doing with short-lived, shallow-rooting exotics and when we're trying to deal with an existential crisis like climate change? It couldn't, it really just could not be more, um, yeah. I can think of all sorts of East Coast terms for it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, um, you know, just to be fair, uh, the people that are planting uh, permanent forests with pine trees or anything else ha have to uh, be able to demonstrate that it is a permanent forest. And uh, a lot of the effort now, and uh, I think a whole lot more work needs to go into uh, how they intend to transition those forests to um, to native forest, to permanent forest. and in the longer term. And uh, I just noted that the Journal of Forestry, which has come out in the last couple of days, has two or three articles in that looking at exactly this discussion. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, there's a whole lot more to be understood. And uh, I agree with uh, Natalie that it's a dangerous area to rush, rush into without the work being done. But uh, I think the uh, permanent forest structure requires uh, that um, the landowner or the or the person receiving carbon credits is able to demonstrate that the forest they have on the land is permanent. How confident are you that there's going to be intergenerational management of these permanent pine permanent exotic forests? Because it's a big ask, isn't it, to manage a forest like that? Peter, so you know when you see foresters rushing in, as it's been said, what confidence levels do you have that management, investment, skills, labour will continue well beyond the initial kind of um, sales story? Yeah, um, <laughs> I can't claim to have a lot of confidence simply because I don't have a lot of experience and. I don't think anybody else has done this for long enough to uh, to be able to demonstrate that it'll always work. But uh, I think unless we look at um, the issue, uh, uh, you're quite right. We could end up with a disaster in some areas. So mm. we need to. We certainly need to do a whole lot more work in this area. But I, I think um, in some areas and with some species. Uh, it certainly looks a lot more promising than uh, we may have first thought. Well, I hope you're right. Damien, do you share Peter's confidence? Well, no, no, I don't, because um, in the areas where they're trying to do it at the moment, like the Marlborough Sounds, where they are actually trying to restore um, old pine forests into natives, what you're seeing there, I, I listened to that webinar, and they talked about seed showers, for example, you know, having islands in the middle of these vast pine forests and, and and somehow or other the birds are supposed to bring in enough seed to populate them mm. with natives when the seed shower that's going to come out of a conifer forest is going to be overwhelmingly conifer seeds. And that's what they're finding in the Marlborough Sounds is that 
you, you create a, a light island and it fills up with, um, with, with pine seedlings. And if you want to actually deal to that, you, it's very expensive. And in the sort of country that Natalie and I are familiar with, I just don't think it's practical. You know, how are you going to get in there and sort of you know, spray all these pine seedlings that are popping up in the midst of, in this very steep, treacherous country? It's not going to be economically viable. So I'm incredibly sceptical. Uh, it could be, I think the people that are talking about it are, you know, full of the best intentions. But um, when you've got a lot of overseas ownership, one thing we've learned on the East Coast is that um, they're very good at running for the hills when the when their uh, <laughs> environmental impacts happen. Yeah, uh, they they either flick it off uh, or else they go bankrupt. They just basically they don't they're not there when when the shambles arrives. Yeah. And local people are the ones that suffer every time. And we're talking and inter we intergenerational be... as well. You know, yes. the, the, the lifetime that we're talking about is, is uh, you know, more than 80 years. So um, uh, I don't know why, but I have gorse coming into my mind which, as you're talking of, of good intentions. You know, it was a terrific idea in Scotland. Yeah, possums. Hmm. Great idea. You know, rabbits. <laughs> Fantastic. It's interesting. You know, pine trees. You know gorse is one trees. of the best. Sorry, Damien. Gorse is one of the best nurses for native plants. And if you, you only got to look at the hills around Wellington, around Auckland, South Auckland, uh, areas that were in gorse 20 years ago are now in um, tall native uh, uh, secondary forest, really. Oh, touche. Fair point. Uh, point to Peter. Um, if we were thinking about planting native forests, right from the start, uh, and we were a landowner like uh, Jeff Ross, what what would we do, Jeff? How would, what's, uh, you know, uh, tell us about your experience. You know, what was your motivation and how have you done it? How have you planted? I think it's um, 15,000 um, trees, did you say? Yeah, that's right. Um, I just want to add a little point. It's interesting in some parts of the country, um, inland Gisborne, there's a whole lot of monocultures being planted. Uh, in my part of the world, Central Otago, taxpayers are paying a huge amount of money to rid um, the landscape of wilding pines at the moment. So it seems uh, there's a little bit of irony going on there at the moment and something not quite right in that. Um, perhaps we have allowed the pine to take a too big a role in, in our landscape, I suspect. And, and unfortunately, right at the minute, that doesn't seem to be slowing. Um, and, and I find it really interesting, um, you know, Damien published a paper some time ago about the carbon sequestration of a native forest versus an exotic monoculture forest. And, and it, um, it would be no surprise that a native forest it sequesters a whole heap more carbon, certainly in time, than a exotic forest. And that's exactly what the world needs at the moment. So why isn't a market exist that if a totara tree is um, far more effective in a totara forest in, a, in sequestering carbon than a, than a monoculture, why isn't there a market that, that values that and places the same, same value on that? Um, just Natalie, do you think the voluntary carbon exchange that's starting to emerge, I heard a comment this morning that credits that aren't ETS certified are actually starting to achieve quite strong pricing globally. And just, just as one kg of butter is from one country is quite different from another kg of butter from another country and how we price it, do you think there's an opportunity for us to, whilst we're waiting on government to act, which they need to on this one, is there an opportunity for us to price our carbon credits ourselves uh, at a premium and create a market or promote a market that pays a premium for native tree forests over exotic. Is, is that something that we can get on and do as New Zealanders? It is what we absolutely should do under urgent <laughs> urgency. Uh, we should be marketing a, a credit, a regenerative credit. This is, this is about more than just biodiversity. This is about our fresh water systems, our, our, you know, our productive land producing clean, green food, it's about our ability to sequester um, more carbon. Uh, this is about uh, a, a credit a, a credit market opportunity that is right at our fingertips. We've had an incredible, uh, well, a gift really in terms of how New Zealand has responded 
responded to COVID uh, and, and how we're seen on the, on the world stage in this moment, we have an opportunity to launch an alternative to, to what we have in, available to us currently. Um, but it requires that we, we get in behind it. We also need to recognize that markets love to price risk <laughs> and, and, and we need to recognize that the, the carbon risk in a native forest is actually an opportunity. <laughs> this long game um, and, the, and all of the conditions that are required for a native forest to thrive, it's, it's not a vulnerability for the market. It's exactly what the market wants is the ability to speculate on the performance of, of the value of native forests. We just need uh, mechanisms and instruments that allow us to take a punt on the future value and make sure that those investors see the reward at the end. Um, this is about recognizing that this value plays out over time and the market needs to capture that, um, that risk and that value fully. Um, and I believe we can do it. Uh, and now is the time to do it. And the voluntary market sit, provides us with that platform. Yeah, and, and it feels like just, you know, hearing the second hand, some of the voluntary markets are starting to move that way, thank goodness. So capitalism can, um, you know, drive, in the, drive us in the right direction. Ideally, you know, brands like Patagonia, you know, the, these are kind of flagship brands that are actually starting to, you know, raise the bar that other brands will follow. And for them to participate in high quality carbon credits of a New Zealand native forest and pay a premium for that, I guess my hope is that will that will drive the market in, in the right direction. And then finally, Vincent, to, to answer your question. Look, we're fortunate. Um, we, we did um, plant 15,000 trees and we, we'll keep, continue to plant um, trees. And it hasn't compromised the productivity of, of our sheep and beef farm. Um, it's connected to existing native forests together. So we're, in time, we're going to get this bird corridor. Um, and then we think, you know, the biodiversity of the region will will um, will increase and then we'll start our hope and with the help of David Norton um, is to start bringing some of that beach forest that used to exist in this area into some of the gullies that are we don't have thankfully gorse down here Peter but we do have a lot of Madagari and that's also a great seed a great pioneering um, um, uh, um, I, I guess plant mm -hmm. to help bring um, beach into our region and um, we've thankfully we've had some help from trees that count as well. So, and some local volunteer groups. So we we haven't been entirely alone in it. It's uh, interesting that uh, so much goodwill is around native planting. Um, you know, volunteer help programs like trees that count. If you said, um, "Hey, well, I want to plant a thousand pine trees. Come and help us," it, it, that's unlikely. There is a kind of limit too, though, on the. Um because as Natalie was pointing out, you know, what is driving a lot of this land use change on, which is very radical and it's happening at, at breakneck speed, is the ETS itself. It's a, it's a, it's a mechanism, it's a machine, mm. and it's producing these impacts in, in, on the ground and in communities in a way that they can't really, and the, I think the voluntary stuff can mitigate that, it's really important, it's fantastic to harness that. But at the same time, I think we do also have to look at what we can do to the ETS, and there is an opportunity there. They've got a permanent forest category coming in. I'm sure that the people that are doing these um, mass plantings of pine trees are going to try and get their pine forests into that category. Yeah. I think that is a complete, that would be a huge mistake. Uh, the rest of the ETS is all geared to pines. That category should be for natives only. And it then could become one part of the machine, at least, that was actually giving proper value uh, to the planting of native forests for all the reasons that we've talked about, including carbon. I think we need a long-term strategy as part of the ETS as well as a short-term one. And the long-term strategy is not going to be pine trees mm. because they only last 80 to 90 years. So for the, when we talk permanent forests, let's not, let's not play stupid semantics and pretend the pine forests are permanent forests, carbon forests, they're not. That should be for natives, that category. And that would provide, you know, another secure, properly funded uh, mechanism for landowners to, to say, okay, I'll put my land into that category there. Yeah. It's, it's competitive with pines. I can do that and I can use this bit of my farm or I can, you know, it's, we need something like that in the ETS right now. Yes. Um, there's a, some interesting questions uh, related to that. Amen. Um, on the 
on the um, Q and A, and one of them is uh, from Nicola Patrick, who's just asking a very basic question: How do we transition to longer term returns on biodiverse carbon based investments for nature without subsidising private enterprise? And it, you know that'll that'll be music to your ears, Jeff, because um, you know we don't want to have to always rely on the on the government. To, to fix these things. And um, so maybe the question is for, for Jeff and for Natalie, um, what mechanisms are you seeing in addition to the ETS that are going to be playing into the hands of uh, foresters or landowners that want to plant native forests? If I could just jump in here, I just, we're already paying. <laughs> we're already paying for this problem everywhere. We, we've, we're seeing it show up in terms of, uh, you know, emergency responses, uh, road costs, uh, uh, waterways uh, uh, restoration. This is this is everywhere, and it's baked in already. We just need to recognise that this cost already exists mm. and start to price it in. <laughs> um, it's it's yep. that's all that we need to do is just recognize that the system is connected and so you can't just exclude certain costs and 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 then seek to avoid the same cost somewhere else it just doesn't it doesn't work we um you know our regional councils have a role to play our central government has a role to play in stimulating uh a, a, a kind of turnaround in the market um but we also need to recognize that this money is flying out the door today uh so just redirected. You mean flying out the door in in effectively subsidising uh, pine, pine plantations? Forestry. Absolutely. With every single you know weather event that occurs out on the east coast, we have an enormous taxpayer burden uh, to 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 redo roads, to restabilise bridges, to clear up pine slash from the beaches. This. This is not an act, you know, this is a reactive subsidy. Um, we just need to get into a positive, positive mm. mindset around stimulating the right sort of investment. This is this is everybody has a role to play, public and private, but it requires that we're honest about where these costs are showing up today. Mm. Good answer. Jeff, at a, a really practical level as a farmer and a and a landowner, is there a premium that you can gain on your products as a result of having native forest on your land? Starting to be, if we, particularly in wool, we have wool customers in Europe who recognize that because the big, the big macro trend worldwide is consumers want to connect with the source of their food and fiber. They want to know where it comes from. They want to look into your backyard and via the internet, they can quite literally do that. So we have wool customers in Europe that want to know the source of their fiber. <clears throat> They want to know the station, the values, you know, the animal husbandry, um, and and really importantly, and in growing importance, the biodiversity of where that fibre comes from. And so, yes, they are starting to pay a premium for it. Um, it's going to come to meat soon, I think. We're, we're speaking with some big meat producers that will pay a premium for meat sourced from a biodiversity-rich environment. And I would hope in time it will come to milk as well. There's a few more challenges there mm -hmm. so so it's the the market forces are there somewhat in paying premiums for product products from like wool for instance from biodiversity rich environment our, our carbon footprint was calculated at lake and West station where we're on the right side of the ledger because of the the trees that we we have were two times carbon positive so a premium can be gained for that uh, we're hearing as i mentioned before a premium for albeit voluntary um, carbon credits of, of native forests. But my, my fear is um, we really, those dials need to be turned much quicker uh, and stronger and some assistance and messaging from government uh, and, and some quite obvious flaws in the current ETS need to be corrected re relatively soon. You know, for instance, that there has to be from our country selling ETS credits to the world. Why isn't there a premium on native forest credits tomorrow in, in yep. New Zealand? You know, that, I, don't, I can't understand. If we're selling a pine credit and a native forestry credit, why can't tomorrow, it's, it's simply just legislation, why can't tomorrow we, we add a premium to a native forest credit? And, and then have a, like all markets, 
then have a supply and demand calculation, which would allow us in time to raise, ideally raise the price of that native forest credit, and that will dri- that ultimately will drive behaviours. So it sounds like uh, Pure Advantage is um, taking on the responsibility for solving that problem. We're working, on, we're working on it, and well, that, that's you know that's the the you know the catalyst for for this very campaign. Which yeah, yeah, that, well. that's yeah. Good. that's great. Ultimately, what we get. Peter, another uh, revenue opportunity is is timber, and <clears throat> we spend a little bit of time in this series talking about native timbers as an opportunity. We haven't fully explored it. Um, it how realistic is it that um, we could be harvesting and what kind of harvesting would we need to do if we were to develop a timber, a native timber industry? Well, of course we do, um, and it is possible to uh, harvest native timber in New Zealand now. You have to have a, uh, a permit from the uh, ministry and uh, uh, the harvest is... Uh, done on a sustainable basis. So it, it's all feasible, it's all possible. Dayman made the point uh, very early on that New Zealand's got a wonderful suite of um, native species, native timbers, and it's ironic that uh, today we, we barely harvest, we barely grow, uh, uh, grow them. And uh, I think um, under... Uh, a good example is uh, Tortora Forest in Northland, but we've also got the same case with Beach on the West Coast. There are native forests regenerating on private land, and it's quite uh, feasible and practical. We've demonstrated the ability to harvest individual trees while maintaining uh, the core forest on the ground. Um, and of course, these native timbers, by taking out uh, high quality logs, periodically um, command a good price in the market as well. So we've been doing this with uh, Totara in Northland and uh, um, we've been, I, I guess, pretty impressed with the quality of the timber that we've been able to mm. saw out of some pretty ugly trees and uh, uh, the the ability to use that. So uh, I, I think there's a great opportunity with timber, it tends to sneak in behind uh, everything else, but it's still probably the single most valuable component of a tree. Hmm. Um, I know, Damien, you talk about near to nature forestry and continuous cover forestry. In what way are those disciplines or new methods of forestry applicable in New Zealand? Well, I think we shouldn't forget that, um, you know, we've been using our forests for probably around about a millennium. I mean, Māori used the forests for all sorts of purposes for a very long time, and then Europeans came and we built most of our buildings originally out of the native forests, mm. and they're beautiful yeah. timbers. As, Great point. As, so we, the problem, what we haven't done is what many countries in Europe have done over the last 20 years. They've looked at conifer forests. They've looked at the risks of fire under climate change. They've looked at uh, they are all getting attacked by bark beetles because they're monocultures and lots and lots of forests are dying in northern Europe and going up in flames. And so 20 years ago, Germany and other countries like Denmark and most of the Scandinavian countries, Switzerland, a whole range of European countries said monoculture forestry is not the way to go. Let's look at our indigenous forestry stocks. Let's grow forests, regrow forests um, from species that are well adapted to those particular habitats and those particular uh, settings. Mm. And then we'll manage them in ways that which are ecologically uh, astute. So they manage them for the water as well as, so a lot of the foresters are trained in ecology, they're trained in hydrology. Um, and they manage these forests so that they harvest them in small coops. They don't use sprays by and large. And it's continuous forest, it's continuous harvesting in small coops. So these are high quality jobs. Foresters are highly respected in Europe. Uh, they're knowledgeable people and, um, and they understand you know, the, the full ecosystem that they're dealing with in a way that we have no idea about in the kind of forestry we're doing at the moment. Mm. So there's a huge opportunity because when Natalie talks about the costs of what's going on with our kind of, you know, cover the place in, in regimented uh, rows of pine trees, um, increasingly we do very little to them um, and if, it, if they go into permanent pine forests so then it's lock up and leave so there's no jobs you know this is a terrible thing for rural communities 
Mm. Um, even the transition into pine forest in the first place meant that many communities, the school shut down, you know, they lost, there weren't enough jobs for the fences anymore and the vets and these sort of things. So the rural communities, one by one on the East Coast, started to die. Mm. And this will be the death knell for many if, if they start doing this lock up and leave forestry. You need jobs. And that's the beauty of close to nature forestry. It creates continuous, very skillful, um, you know, kind of ecologically responsible jobs for local people. It would be fantastic, um, you know, for iwi, for example, uh, to have young people being trained in these disciplines and working in the forests in, in, in ways which kind of, you know, build on that long connection. Yeah. And, and I just see so much. They're gorgeous timbers. Um, my husband's an architect. We, we've used them a lot just to show people how beautiful they are. Yeah. And, and yeah. they're superior in, their, in many of their qualities to pine trees by a very long shot. I, so, I suspect um, you're even, so you, why not, you might even you know? be talking to us from a, from a villa with a, um, with a Rimu ceiling, perhaps, um, from where we can, what we can see. Um, Peter and, and Natalie, um, We've had um, young um, Sheridan Ashford on on our very first show, and she was a young forester who had, um, she was very excited about her career as a forester opening up in front of her, and she was starting to think about ecology, you know, and, and doing exactly what Damien's talking about. Um, maybe first to you, um, Natalie, you know, the, the job opportunities for ecological foresters and, and farm, um, for, for forest Keepers, lovers, looker after us. There must be massive opportunity on the East Coast for that. Yeah, there's a huge opportunity. Um, if we can start to get the market mechanisms working for native forests, then we're going to see an absolute boom in green jobs and in, in the, the sorts of expertise um, and, and trades that, that Dayman has just described and, and that have flourished in, in Europe. This idea that you know managing a forest, uh, you know, and a native forest for the all of the benefits that they provide would be such a you know as a, a profession, such a um, so much so full of pride. I think um, mm, mm. to be able to 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 do that work, uh, and that that's all ahead of us if we can get this right. Uh, and and I really do think we can. Uh, and to to be honest, I think I think the East Coast has to. There is no other option for the East Coast but to to embrace this. This is the 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 direction we need to go in. Uh, but I think in doing that, we will create a, a wonderful blueprint for a, for a new type of economy um, around forests. Mm. Peter, the, the, your your industry is has, has, uh, is aging, if I can put it politely. But, uh, you know, what opportunities might exist for young people to come into a, a different kind of forestry service? Yeah, well, I think all of the comments that Natalie and Damien are making are, of course, correct. There are, there are big opportunities in these areas around planting and management, weed control, pest control, all of the things that are important in maintaining a forest and maintaining a healthy forest and, and a thriving forest uh, going forward. There's a big opportunity out there right now. I think uh, beef and lamb have estimated that there's at least a million hectares of reverting scrubland on uh, freehold farmland out there now. Most of it hasn't got a fence around it. Most of it's got weeds. A lot of it has got pest issues. Uh, if we could only use mechanisms such as the ETS and perhaps uh, some sort of premium uh, credit, uh, you could employ a lot of people, but even more importantly, uh, you could create an extremely valuable resource and do it very quickly. Uh, a lot of these areas have got trees of uh, harvestable dimension in them. They've got uh, opportunities for things like uh, honey, medicinal drugs, chemicals, mm. um, and so forth. So, uh, um, yeah, there's there's really a great opportunity. We just need to pick it up and run with it. You know, one of the things we haven't touched on, and, and perhaps this is something for you, Damien, is is really to kind of bring it right back to our um, mana whenua. The Indigenous worldview is so much more holistic in this regard. 
isn't it, of seeing resources in their complete um, uh, kind of connected sense. Um, what role could Māori and uh, Te Ao Māori worldview play in the development of this uh, uh, kind of renewed vision of New Zealand forests? Well, um, one of the people that we work with in, in Te Rafati is uh, Graham Atkins, who's um, kind of helped to spearhead the restoration of the Rokumara Ranges, a huge, huge challenge. Uh, that's a dog estate uh, forest, which is being eaten to death, basically. Um, and, you know, the knowledge of somebody like Graham, I mean, he, he, lives, he lives in these living systems of plants and, and animals and um, he, you know, the waterways. He knows how all of these things work together and with the ocean. And uh, people like that have a huge amount of knowledge of these ecosystems mm. and a love of them. And, and I, you know, I think that this is something which is very Kiwi as well, that, you know, you want to be tangata whenua, you need to actually understand the landscapes of which you're a part. And you need to have, our kids need to be in the, you know, to have relationships with them from the time they're small and for this to be part of the school curriculum. And so we've been running a program at our place for, for young kids to give them those opportunities. And I think, you know, the, the future for Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, it's sort of learning what we've already got. These beautiful, I mean, our islands are so gorgeous. Mm. They really are, they're beautiful and they're very diverse. And we have got this extraordinary biota, which is unique on the planet. And the challenge for us is to learn to live with it, you know, and to understand as you do in, uh, in Tikanga Māori and Te Ao Māori, you're linked up with these things through whakapapa, you know, this great big network of life of which human beings are one part. And when people say, I'm the river and the river is me, that's actually true, you know, the river's dying, so am I. Well, people do get sick when our rivers start to get polluted. When our forests die, when our birds go silent, we're all losing, you know, part of who we are as, as Kiwis, as New Zealanders. And, and yet there's this opportunity, you know, this chance for us to say, look, world, um, we as a people, drawing on the legacies from Europe as well, the web of life, people, you know, there's those kind of philosophies in Europe, complexity theory with the cut, cutting edge science, but also whakapapa and tikanga Māori, bring all those together and generate a new kind a regenerative agriculture, forestry, fisheries, so that people in our country are living with the land and the ocean and the waterways in the way that human beings must if we are going to survive. Mm. Well, Kiora, that is an excellent way to end our uh, webisode. I, you know, we could, couldn't get a better summary, could we, Peter, even if we tried to write it down. Um, so uh, it, it's uh, my pleasure and duty to thank you as panelists for joining us. Uh, thank you to uh, for the leadership of uh, Tane's Tree Trust and Pure Advantage for bringing this whole series together and also the website. And please do visit the website, read some of that fantastic material, join the, the discussion. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, audience, for joining us in the series. Uh, the questions have been great. We, uh, like last, most times, we haven't got to them, have we, Simon? But we're doing our best. Um, and uh, please keep the discussion going. We, we have more in the pipeline, uh, not just webisodes, but more content uh, as well, because uh, so long as the problem exists, we, we need to um, be part of the solution. So uh, thank you for joining us and uh, we wish you well uh, and um, have a good night. Enohara. No